everybody, welcome again. Um, I thought about this topic because I'm outside in the sun all the time and I've been thinking about my skin and how I'm protecting it and how I'm moisturizing it and how I'm preventing it as I'm getting older, um, how, is it, how I'm maintaining it, taking good care of it. So I just thought we would touch on skin health a little bit and what it takes to have healthy skin. Um, and since I get to go first today, I get to explain a little bit how it all works, but um, there's three layers really of the skin and it's the outer epidermis layer, the middle um, dermis layer, and then a, like a tissue layer underneath. And um, I want you to remember that the skin is the largest organ in the body, right? It covers our whole body and it has such an important function. Um, it's, it's there to protect us, number one. And so we think of that a lot right now with coronavirus, that the first line of protection is barrier and that's our skin. So uh, it's really important that we have a good skin um, that's doing its job actually. So, and hopefully we appreciate how good it's doing for us. Um, and so, that, so that's one, it's protection for us. Um, the skin also is important in regulating body temperature. So um, whether we have a fever, we'll know how, um, what's going on inside of us when we're cold, um, it's the blood vessels uh, can dilate or constrict and regulate blood flow and help us control whether we let, temp let heat off or whether we let kind of try to let heat in. Um, interestingly, um, the more I learn about the, the uh, skin, now we know all about the skin uh, bacteria, the microbiome on it, bacteria, viruses, fungus, that there's a whole population running through a whole body. And that sets up a whole nother set of um, something that we can discuss down the road a little bit in this talk later today. So that's important to know. And it's important for sensory. So the skin is right when we touch something, how do we know if it's hot and we don't harm ourselves or how do we touch or it's our way of communication. And it's also important it's an indicator of our health. So we use, I use skin all the time. I'm looking at my patients, each and every one of you guys, when I see you online, your happy little faces, I'm looking at you if you're pale, if you're dusky, if you have a little rosacea, right? A little inflammation in your cheeks, uh, looking at your skin color. And so that tells me a whole lot about you right from the get-go, just taking a look right there. So, so many um, functions to the skin. And um, did I cover all of those? Yeah. Uh, so. And, oh, and the last one is biosynthesis. So the skin is important. Also, it helps us synthesize very important nutrients such as vitamin D, right? It takes out those UVB ray lights and, and gets the process started. It happens right there in our skin. So with all that being said, it's so important that we take good care of the skin and maintain it. And um, I'm just gonna say the one obvious is that uh, our skin is switching over every about 28 days, I read recently and um, so that's about every month so our whole lives every month we're regenerating new skin right imagine that so if you don't if you're not happy in your skin go ahead and change it because <laughs> um, that's what's happening and how do we how do we regenerate healthier skin well it's the same thing right skin starts from with, within us within us so it's what we eat what we put into our bodies what's going to be incorporated into the cells so that's why we're another reason we're such big promoters of the whole food plant-based diet putting in the best nutrients that are filled with fiber to, to help feed the microbiome which is going to navigate how um, the skin the skin microbiome uh, connection um, to, it helps with antioxidants, which are so important to our skin, such as we all hear about carotenoids, right? And there's a reason because carotenoids, that orange pigment, pigment found in our green, orange, yellow, and red vegetables, that orange pigment helps our skin every time it's growing, growing to healthier skin. So really important, the antioxidants. It's also shown to prevent cancer, those, those colorful fruits and vegetables and all those antioxidants. Um, so I can't stress that enough. And then omega-3 fatty acids, we wanna have just a little bit in our, um, that is helping to keep our skin, um, high, uh, what's the word for it? Um, the fat layer of our skin to keep it to its plump layer that it's supposed to, it's supposed to be. Um, so again, so it functions well as a barrier for us and doesn't look wilty and dry. Um, so, so really promoting a whole food plant-based diet when I'm working with my patients with skin issues, we're working on always the gut issue because there's that connection and we're working together on making sure they're getting the antioxidants and the fiber and that it's low glycemic often because high, high glycemic low like sugar can cause it also to age faster to 
be inflammatory and not grow into its healthiest self. So we'll work on low glycemic diets as well as a part of it, avoiding known toxins and triggers. So again, that comes in the processed foods and animal products and saturated fats and things like that. But just by removing that and flooding our body with the nutrients and the, the whole food plant-based diet, especially the green leafy vegetables, which you know I'm always promoting, and the colorful fruits and vegetables and the fiber, skin starts to take on a great look and, and um, have more of a glow to it. And the last thing is, um, two more things I would say is just really hydration is key to keeping our skin plump and, and, and healthy as um, it's turning over all the time. Um, and exercise is key as well. So when you exercise, you're increasing blood flow and circulating everything around. And so it's really important to, if we're exercising while we're regenerating our healthy skin every month, um, to really help us generate our healthiest self. And that's my brief overview. And I'd love to hear um, what you guys have to contribute to today's skin health. Dr. Clapper, what would you like to add to excellent uh, oh, description there? Really, not much. <clears throat> I used to play some semi-professional baseball. And uh, when you hit a home run, you got to be sure you, you touch every base going around <laughs> the diamond there. And boy, Chris, you just hit every base uh, on that home run. You, you, you touched all the points that I, that I was going to raise. Uh, but a couple things um, that I would add. But that, that was it's so important. The skin is such a great reflector about what's happening on the inside of our body. Uh, and, you know, the old uh, saying from the computer guys, uh, girls, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Well, garbage in sure comes out uh, on the skin there. It's certainly, it's certainly uh, it's a pretty uh, eloquent organ. <clears throat> and the fats in the diet certainly play a role. But before I get into that, uh, you, you really need those vitamins and minerals to, uh, uh, it's such a vital organ. There's such a great blood flow in the skin, obviously. And, and it really needs the same vitamins and minerals that your muscles need, and your, that your nerves eat, need, et cetera. So those salads and soups and steamed veggies are really, really important for your skin, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> when people who've had skin problems, the chronic acne folks, et cetera, uh, the psoriasis folks, uh, when they change to a whole food plant-based diet and, and really emphasizing that they, you know, they leave behind the vegan junk foods and with all the omega-6 oils and all that stuff. When they really adopt a whole food plant-based diet, one thing many, not all, unfortunately, but many, many, many of them uh, report, gee, my skin clear, gee, my acne got better, gee, my psoriasis is better. Well, why does that happen? Uh, and these, of course, are very complex uh, issues, but a, but a couple of things, uh, regarding uh, better looking skin on plant-based diets. Uh, one, uh, things that are in there uh, and things that aren't in, the, in your dietary stream. Now, the things that are in, you know, the major thing, uh, when you switch from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, you change the quality of the fats. So you change the quality of everything, actually, of course, but you know, certainly the fats change. How do they change? Well, it, they are, uh, they're lighter fats. You're, you're changing heavy saturated fats, which are solid at, at room temperature, uh, versus vegetable oils. Uh, and, and again, we're talking not talking about oil in a bottle, but we're talking about those micro droplets uh, of flaxseed oil in the full flax seeds and in the walnut oil and that are in, in the whole walnuts. We're talking about fats and whole foods. But these fats get into your, uh, the, these fats are what your skin oils uh, are made from. And so you so talk about an oil change, like a car, well, there's an oil change for your skin. And the fact that the, the vegetable oils are just lighter and, and more fluid, uh, uh, they don't tend to clog up the pores and invite infection. And it's one reason why acne seems to get better. And, and these lighter vegetable oil, uh, vegetable fats, I should say, um, they lubricate the skin better, and so there's often just better uh, hydration in the skin. Uh, but, um, and they are less pro-inflammatory. The, uh, the heavy saturated fats, uh, the animal fats, uh, have a particular kind of fat called arachidonic acid, which uh, leads to inflammatory prostaglandin production, and you whip those out when you leave the animal products behind. And so that makes the skin less uh, in, in, in an inflammatory state. 
Finally, uh, we've learned the hard way, uh, although it's pretty solidly established now, <clears throat> um, that uh, if you've got uh, acne issues, uh, dairy products are not your friend. And, and it's turning out that there are proteins uh, in, whey, in, uh, in cow's milk, whey and lactobumin, that turn on genes in the oil glands of the skin, uh, TORC1 and, and others, uh, that, that make the oil glands put out a particularly acidic oil that clogs up the glands and leads to acne uh, production. Uh, and uh, so leaving the dairy behind is one of the, uh, uh, the best things you could do. Um, I remember when I was a kid and in, in, high, in, in grammar school uh, health class, uh, the, the uh, gym teacher would say, don't eat chocolate, it gives you acne. And we all rolled our eyes. Well, it turns out he was right but not for the reason he thought. We assumed it was from the sugar and the, and the cocoa, but it turns out it's the milk and the milk chocolate actually was really uh, more acnogenic. Um, and, uh, and the same thing, uh, psoriasis is a very complex uh, issue here. And uh, uh, I can't say it's only from the oils involved there, but, um, the, uh, but, uh, but psoriasis often gets better on a, uh, a plant-based diet. One last thing before we leave acne, I was, um, uh, there's a, an excellent book that I often recommend um, called The Clear Skin Book uh, for people with acne. And this is written by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Nelson sisters. They're twin girls who um, are very prominent on the internet. Uh, and they had really severe uh, acne, facial acne, and it was uh, very detrimental to their uh, to their media careers. And they tried everything to try and get rid of it. Finally, they asked uh, our colleague uh, John McDougall, uh, and um, he said, "Pull the soy out of your diet." And they did, and lo and boom, their acne cleared up. And it was very dramatic. And I'm saying. Why in the world would that happen? Why would soy play a role in acne? And I was, uh, couldn't figure that out till later the answer presented itself to me. It turns out it's not a big problem uh, for, for folks, uh, but these uh, girls were eating a lot of soy and tofu and soy milk, et cetera, et cetera. And we've all heard about the phytoestrogens in soy and uh, they in general don't cause a problem. In general, they are protective against breast cancer, et cetera. But what they can do, however, is block the, uh, uh, the site where estrogens would normally uh, uh, exert their estrogenic activity and lock up the estrogen. And because even the female body produces some androgen, some testosterone, as you bind up the estrogen, it produces a, in these particular girls' bodies, a relative excess of testosterone. And it was the, and the relative testosterone excess was what's making uh, the acne erupt. And we stop the soy and rebalance their estrogens and testosterone. Uh, it turns out the, uh, their acne uh, cleared up. So interesting. Uh, soy is such a wonderful product. I don't want people running the other way when they think about having some tofu. But if you're someone who's really struggling with acne and you've already gone uh, completely plant-based, uh, think about taking a holiday from soy products for a couple of months and see if that, uh, uh, if that doesn't uh, help with the blemishes on your skin there. So I'm sure we'll have other things to say, um, but uh, <clears throat> uh, be gentle with your skin. Uh, wear those hats, uh, wear the sunscreen. The sun is in gentle. That said, especially in the morning hours when the sun is still low on the horizon and the sunbeams are coming in at a very gentle angle through lots of, uh, of the atmospheric air. Now, uh, we need some sun on our skin. I think it, it's, uh, we've become so heliophobic. We're so, we're so afraid of the sun these days, oh, photo aging and skin cancer, etc. But I think 20 minutes of morning sun on your skin is a wonderful thing, or in the late afternoon. And uh, it is, as Chris says, it helps vitamin D production. It, it just, it, it helps our brain, helps our neurochemical all the way around. We, we, we have a relationship with the sun. And we shouldn't let modern life totally disrupt that. So I'm a big fan of um, uh, getting out in the sunshine for at least 20, 30 minutes. It won't give anybody skin cancer. And I, I think it generally is a, is a beneficial thing to do. And as she rightly said, drink enough water. Uh, we, uh, dehydration certainly shows up in the skin and it certainly contributes to aging. Uh, and um, 
in the morning um, after I come out of the shower, I'll put a little moisturizing lotion on your, on the, on your face, uh, my face. <clears throat> um, the time to apply moisturizing lotion is when you immediately come out of the shower and your skin is all full of water from the shower. That's the time to put those uh, uh, put those hyd those uh, hydrating lotions on to lock that water into the skin so it diffuses through the upper layers of your skin rather than just evaporating off to the air. So if you're, especially if you're an eczema person, you've got dry skin, Get that moisturizer on. That moisturizer on as soon as you step out of the shower within five minutes, and you'll uh, you'll wind up with better hydration of the skin. Okay, I'm sure other things will present themselves, but I don't want to ramble on too long. So uh, with that, I will uh, uh, relay it back to uh, uh, to Dr. Marvis to uh, see what she has to continue. Uh, has to contribute. All right, that's excellent. So you guys just got basically skin 101, like college level <laughs> there. So um, to to add to it, we do have a question here. Does the use of sunscreen, uh, sunscreen diminish the absorption of vitamin D? So basically, like, does sunscreen use, use lead to vitamin D deficiency? So basically, when you think about that, um, the high SPS sunscreens, they're designed to filter out the UVB, and that's actually what triggers the vitamin D production in the skin. Um, clinical studies actually really haven't found that everyday use um, of sunscreen has led to vitamin D insufficiency. So I, I think you're okay, and remember, that when you use an SPF of 15, that filters out like 93% of the UVB rays, SPF 30 is about 97%, SPF is about 58%, or excuse me, 98% filtering out. So that leaves anywhere from like, what, two to 7% of the UVB reaching your skin, and that's if you use it perfectly. So I don't think it takes much to get that vitamin D going. So, you know, when you weigh the pros and cons of using sunscreen, you definitely want to weigh in, you know, the sunscreen. But like, you know, Dr. Klepper is saying, early morning sun, late evening, that's also gonna be less harmful to the skin. So just some thoughts there for you. Um, so we have a lot of questions actually also about like, you know, the dry skin and psoriasis. Um, so I think, you know, what you said, do you have any additional, Chris or um, Dr. K, anything about the dry skin once someone goes to plant-based um, diet? Sometimes they do develop some dry skin, especially if you live like where I live in Colorado, the environment just goes, it just sucks. Everybody it out has dry skin in Colorado, though. <laughs> <laughs> and you're it's higher. Not, up. It's on the license and the, plate, and the, the dry skin yeah. state. It says so right on the license mm -hmm. plate. Yes, yeah, right. And the altitude, too. So you're closer to the sun's rays. Remember, right? Less of an ozone layer. So um, it's very potent. The rays, people in Colorado, make sure you're always covering your face, especially from aging and wrinkling and all that, and taking extra precautions. But I would say just a quick comment about the sunscreen is that remember it wears off. Um, it's supposed to be reapplied every two hours. Like that's how sunscreen is designed. And most of us don't do that, right? We're lucky if we get it on once in the morning, which is what I tend to do, um, unless I'm like at a beach or something. But um, so it's supposed to be reapplied every two hours. So um, it is fading throughout the day. So especially if you're exposed to the sun, I would say to take precautions and have it on. Um, but as far as moisture to answer your question, um, yeah, no, it's, my tips are just what I, what I kind of said. We, I look at how much they're hydrating. Number one, most people are not hydrating enough in general, myself included. I carry my water to always be reminding myself I should be drinking more, but, um, hydrating is number one and looking into their diet. And, um, as far as omega-3 fatty acids, um, I do want to make sure that they're getting a little bit of that, you know, a small amount of nuts and seeds a day. And what else, what else are they eating? So, you know, if you're sneaking in a little this or that, um, sometimes that could be sabotaging it as well. So um, I also, a trick that I like to do for when people have really dry skin is add those green smoothies because it forces you to drink the water with the greens and, and the omega-3 fatty acids all in one. And so I just feel like if you start our day off with that, especially if dry skin is a concern, um, starting the day off like that kind of can help out, but that's my little tip. Dr. K, anything? Yes, uh, well said. Uh, I'm not a big fan of um, of taking uh, coconut oil or uh, these these oils uh, orally, but one but one good use for them is on your skin, and uh, I think they're they're a lovely uh, lubricating agent. And as I said earlier. Um, when you get, as soon as you get out of the shower, out of the bath, that's a good time to put a coconut oil base uh, moisturizer on your skin to lock in the water. And if you've got a child at home with eczema, 
Uh, absolutely. Um, ex eczematous skin is dry skin, uh, and they uh, <clears throat> and uh, they don't have the oil uh, that uh, that holds the, the moisture into our skin. So uh, we pull your little one out of the tub, and while they're still all wet, uh, that's the time to rub that that oil-containing uh, lubricant base uh, on their on their skin and lock that water in. So um, yeah. uh, drink plenty of water, hold that water in after you bathe, and hopefully your skin should get uh, more moist. Yeah, I absolutely. actually have done some research, sorry to interrupt um, okay. Dr. Marvis, but um, I've done, and it looks like some LDL levels in some people can go up with topical coconut oil, which I really? have been using it. I love it. I love how my skin feels with it. I love how it works, but um, I was just reading, there's small studies, and so I'm not really sure what to make of that. But then there was a dermatologist I was listening to, and she was saying um, not to use coconut oil for kiddos because their body surface area is so large compared to you know the size of the kid, the child, the, especially the little children, and that it can it's been shown to increase their LDL and be a risk factor that they have higher saturated fat. Which I have not seen studies. I didn't have time to research that yet, um, but I found that interesting. It's something I'm definitely going to look into because. I use it, I recommend it, but if it's not a good thing, then I, I should know that. So I just thought that, that was interesting. Yeah. That is really fascinating. I mean, it makes sense. Your skin is absorbing everything that you put onto it. So that is really interesting, fascinating. Yeah, um, yeah we'll have to definitely dig into that. Yeah. So yeah, and with the eczema, I've treated so many kids with eczema, and even my little ones when they were little had eczema, but I also was just drinking dairy and breastfeeding, but you know, and then they went to cow's milk you know, <laughs> type of formula. So, you know, oftentimes, many, many, many times, I have some dramatic stories of patients getting better when they go to a plant-based diet and especially removing the dairy, like Dr. Clapper was speaking about. So very important with little ones with eczema. But then we also have, for example, healthcare workers or others who are working with gloves and they're constantly washing their hands, especially if you're in the OR, like Dr. Clapper was before, and they get really dry skin. They're super sensitive to hospital grade, you know, antimicrobials. So any suggestions for someone like that who's going to be constantly being exposed to something that may be leading to cracked or dried skin? Do either of you guys have any other suggestions there? Uh, no. So uh, I have some uh, colleagues in the emergency room who are, we have been talking a lot about dried cracked hands. And so um, Several of them have been doing things like trying to wash their hands instead of always alcoholing it, which using alcohol, which can be very helpful. That alcohol is so drying. And actually, we'll talk about that because um, if you can wash your hands, I'm always a, a fan of washing hands over using alcohol if that's if you get the choice. Um, and then they were doing things like they had little coconut oils by the sink side, and it was helping them. So they were protecting, and they found that to uh, to um, be very helpful with the dry cracks. And so. Again, now this is something I have to look into, but that's a tool that we, using the oil, we'll just say oil in general, maybe a, a, a plant-based oil um, right after washing their hands. And they have all, they've come back to me and said, oh my God, that's totally working. It's really helping. So um, that's a tip that maybe we could try. Maybe now I'm going to have to look into almond oil. Um, I love the smell of that and see if that's a good alternative and see if I, hopefully my face will look okay next week and then you'll know it's working. <laughs> That's so, great. Uh, yeah. Dr. Clapper, you were in the OR and may have seen some things. Uh, indeed, and it comes down to using those lubricants. And uh, just in this day of, of post-COVID, uh, in the middle of, of COVID times now, uh, you know, wear your mask, keep your distance, and wash your hands, we're told. Uh, and uh, and the more you wash your hands, the more you take the skin oils out. And, uh, and by the way, uh, one phenomenon uh, that happens as we wash our hands frequently um, is it takes oils, soap dissolves oils, it's a detergent, that's what it does, that's why you're washing your hands because it dissolves the uh, oils that's holding the dirt onto your hands there. Now, well, one place it also removes the oils is from the nail plates of your fingernails. And, uh, and as the months go by, if you're washing your hands frequently and you're, you're leaching the oils out of your, the, the nail plates, the actual part that grows, uh, one way it shows up is with these longitudinal cracks um, that go down your nails. 
Uh, and you know, oh, I must have a, a vitamin deficiency or my vegan diet isn't working for me. No, it just means you're washing your hands a lot and you're taking the oil out of your nail plates and they're cracking. Uh, and so uh, there are product ways around this, uh, but again, it comes down to replacing the oils. And, and there are uh, the manicures, you know, there are oils that, uh, that you can apply right directly onto the nail plate and let, them, and let them soak the oil back in. And if you have cracking nails, uh, and again, these are the longitudinal crack, transverse cracks or something else, but these longitudinal ones are largely loss of oil on the nail plates. And so you can, uh, uh, probably almond oil or most any other oils would, would work, uh, but they do have these, uh, the manicures. If you get online, you can see uh, fingernail oil that you can rub in. It's probably almond oil, I suspect. Uh, so, uh, so moisturize your nails as well as the rest of your hand uh, if those cracks are a problem. That's good uh, yeah. And uh, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Miller said, uh, find some lubricant that after you wash your hands, you've lost some oils out of, the, out of your skin, then replace them with some oil-based lubricant. Just a, a couple of drops is all you need, but it'll keep the skin, uh, the skin on your hands from getting too cracked. So that's great because uh, we have a response here. Someone said, her name's Marlene, says, really interesting. I'm a health inspector and I wash my hands constantly. I thought it was a deficiency. So there you go. That is a um, good tip. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, so we have another question. Do you advise taking oral steroids when someone gets a major case of contact dermatitis, unknown origin? So in some cases, a short burst of steroids are needed, or if you get, for example, there's lots of lovely plants that will cause some pretty significant and terrible skin reactions. But do either of you have any thoughts or suggestions on those type of things, especially of unknown origin? Would you have a, a way of starting that um, investigation? Uh, when your skin breaks out, um, one of the first things to ask yourself is, what did I eat the last couple of days? There's a good chance something that went down the, the pipe there uh, is now coming out in, in, in your skin oils and in your skin uh, circulation there. So what we look, think of as contact dermatitis is often a manifestation of something unhappy going on the inside. And so just notice if there's any pain. Gee, every time I eat strawberries, the next day I've got the, the, the contact dermatitis there. It may well be a, uh, uh, something that you're, that you're consuming. Um, but, uh, there, but assuming this is a true contact dermatitis, well, find out what it is you're contacting, if it truly is there. But the, to get to the source of your question about whether a short course of steroids uh, work, um, yes, they do. And, and I don't have much hesitation in using them. They can just be not life-saving, but unless the person retain their sanity before they scratch off their entire epidermis uh, because their skin is so itchy. That said, um, an article came out just a couple of weeks ago saying that even a short course of steroids has a, a not insignificant increase uh, in GI bleeding and, uh, and uh, internal problems from steroids. So if you, if you are on a, uh, a medrol dose pack or the, your doctor gave you five days of prednisone, uh, that's the time to be extra nice to your stomach lining. Stop the alcohol, stop the, you know, the wine with dinner, stop the hot coffee, don't take any aspirin or, or ibuprofen, anything that may irritate that stomach lining. It is not the time uh, if you're on steroids because they make the, uh, the stomach lining extra sensitive, a little friable there. So, uh, so take care of your stomach lining if you do find yourself on a short course of steroids, but they, they can be helpful, absolutely. Chris? Not much to add to that. So he basically mm -hmm. summed up, um, I would do the same exact thing, get yeah, a case by case, depending on how bad your contact dermatitis is and, and your, your medical condition, what's going on. So um, that would be something I would discuss with my patient based on what, what was there at that time. Um, there are other things like antihistamines that you could try to use, um, and um, topical steroids. Yeah, and topical. It would. Yeah, exactly. So, so those are some other ideas to, that you could talk about. But yeah, yeah. sure. Then there's other medications that are topical too, that if this is a chronic issue that you can use that are out of the steroid can, you know, topical steroid or orals, because those, the topical steroids with chronic use can thin the skin, which is an issue, a long-term issue. And so you just got to be really careful. But again, it's a matter of investigation. And sometimes, you know, some individuals will have, they just can't figure it out. It's not the laundry detergent. They change everything. And 
Um, again, that may be something in the diet that ex that's expressing itself through the skin. We have a few other questions I'm trying to see here. Looks like we're getting a lot of questions about gluten. And so I'm just gonna throw one of those in here. Um, I think we got skin fairly wrapped up here, unless you guys have something in addition. Well, well, the, the two meet. There is a medical condition called dermatitis herpetiformis, and mm -hmm. that is from gluten. It's, a, it's the skin complaining about gluten in the diet, and you get these snake-like uh, rows of, uh, of little itchy, itchy, bumpy papules there. Uh, and if you have those, um, uh, you know, you can talk to your doctor about it, but uh, look up dermatitis herpetiformis and just stop the gluten for a month or two. And if they magically goes away, it doesn't come back again. Uh, then you clearly, you know, there's another sign of, of gluten sensitivity. So it, yes, actually it, it, it can show up in the skin. Yeah, so they were, um, the question was about, she goes, uh, where did they, there we go. Any thoughts on gluten and psoriasis in specifics? And just to get, oh, maybe about 10% of people will show up with the RAS associated with um, you know, gluten sensitivity or celiac disease. But any thoughts there on gluten and basically maybe autoimmune disease? Maybe we should kind of move in that direction. Nobody needs gluten. You, know, you can live a long, healthy life without ever ingesting that molecule in any form. So if there's any question, uh, stop the gluten for a month, two months, or give it 60 days with it to clear out of your tissue, and then have three slices of whole wheat bread one day and see what happens. If your skin is, is just elaciously erupted the next day, that's really all you need to know. And, uh, and Maybe just have one slice. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm a big fan of uh, removing all doubt. And, uh, and, uh, but yeah, it was like, but, uh, but if, you're, if you get a big reaction, then, then that's, you're the ultimate lab test. You don't need to send off the gluten antibodies and all that stuff. It's obvious, you know, if, if that's what's happened. So, and then just don't eat gluten. You can certainly live a long, healthy life out of reading gluten. So if, uh, any question, you give yourself a break from it and see what happens. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would say just to add to all that, that um, there is some evidence that gluten, once you have um, a leaky gut, so once your gut is disrupted, the microbiome may be out of balance and the gut is now allowing um, little toxic particles and bacteria to go across mm -hmm. where they're not supposed to, which can happen from inflammation. Once you have that inflammatory state, which we call leaky gut, um, in your gut, gluten is known to actually um, help increase it. Um, uh, what I'll call it a toxin, but it's a little chemical in her called zonulin, and that causes more leaky gut. And so um, I find that when I'm working with my autoimmune people, that I take them all off gluten initially because um, he, it can delay healing. It doesn't mean they all have celiac. I mean, hardly anyone does, although I, I tested in some people, but um, most people will not have it, but we still remove it initially and help the healing like gut heal, let that inflammation quiet down, and then like Dr. Clapper said, we'll bring it back in and see how they do, and, and um, definitely psoriasis responds to a gluten-free diet, so I would, if you're struggling with psoriasis or something you know is, I would take it out for a little bit and heal that inflammation in your gut, and then you can try to bring it back and see how you do, so, and even Dr. Furman's actually even published um, some case studies about his psoriasis patients that he's followed over several years, he's had a couple of patients um, that he's, he's worked with for, or he's followed for so many years and um, gluten was one of the things he took out in them as well found benefits so I found the same thing with my patients yeah that case was actually um go ahead Dr. Oh, Clapper. No, go, go ahead, go ahead. yeah I was just going to say that case actually we published in the IJDRPs and which I'm the managing editor so you guys it's a free open source journal all you have to do is go to ijdrp.org and register and you have access to all of those we don't charge the authors, we don't charge the audience. So it's a great resource. And the more you share that, the more we can move forward in sharing the science of a plant-based diet. But go ahead, Dr. Clapper. Uh, before we leave the uh, person who had a question about the contact dermatitis, uh, and that's a whole thing in itself when you want to avoid the contacts, but just a cautionary tale about that I learned about skin in general as an organ. I was working on a, a remote hospital at a Native American Indian reservation. Uh, uh, up in the mountains of Northern California. And uh, it is poison oak country. And, uh, and it was late summer and this fellow comes into the air and he's just miserable. And, uh, and he, uh, um, uh, oh, he had a, um, 
uh, a classic poison oak. He was out in the, his backyard clearing uh, the, the brush that had grown in. Uh, and he came in, he had that classic red chain of, uh, as, the, as the vine wrapped around his forearm there, you could see the lead where the, where the vine was wrapped around. And he had the blisters and the weeping as a classic poison oak uh, eruption. And so, uh, no, we both knew what it was. And so it gave no steroids and topical steroids and like, cool compresses, et cetera. And, uh, and eventually it takes weeks sometimes, but it finally faded away. Um, end of story, I thought. The next year, uh, who comes back in but Cliff um, and uh, out clear at the same time as it was September of the following year. Hey, Doc, I you got some of that more than I'm a leg this time. And he pulls up his pants leg, and there was another chain like um, lesion of uh, the poison oak uh, blisters, etc. And, um, and he says, Yeah, we both can it. And he said, um, Funny thing, Doc, I was wearing long sleeves. I didn't touch anything, but look at this. And he rolls up his arm, and the and what he had, the very same lesions from the year before, had lit up on his arm once again. Wow. And, and 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 I realized skin has a memory, and the tiny tiny molecule, molecular amounts of, of roost toxin uh, from the poison oak that got into his leg. Wound there, uh, found their way in his bloodstream as it went, as it flowed through his skin up in his arm. It woke up the, those skin cells still remembered how to react to that, and and, and it lit up, and uh, and it was quite a lesson to me about about the skin and uh, and what a long memory can have. And those people, so the, so moving back to the contact dermatitis, if you're if you've continually been ir reacting or irritating one area of the skin, it's going to remember. It's going to take a long time that go to go away and anything that irritates it sometimes even in a distant part of the body uh, it might uh, might wake that up there so uh, mm -hmm. uh, just a point to uh, be aware of and uh, keep that skin mm -hmm. well well hydrated and, and non-irritated absolutely I have seen tons of cases poison ivy and all the poison oaks and that and they may have the contact one place but then it will spread give it a couple and of days it's, the oils, it's intense the oil spread too so it's very yeah. yeah so even if they've showered they've washed but also check your dog if your dog was out with you it can stay on the fur of animals it can stay on your shoes so you know think about all of those things like who's coming in the house and where are they jumping are they on the couch are you on your bed so you got to think about those little furry friends that are maybe bringing something <laughs> too. So um, also we have like some other questions here. This might be interesting. Um, she, Leanne, uh, Leanna, sorry, says, I have a lot of confusion about flour. Can you explain if whole grain pasta, chickpea pasta, edamame, edamame pasta, healthy pastas are really healthy. The plant is made into flour to get into pasta form and flour acts like sugar in the body, correct or no? So who would like to take on the pasta question? I can start with it and okay. then I'll be curious to hear what Dr. Clapper has to add. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, yep. And it is very interesting. And I too have grappled with that just a little bit. So that's why I think I paused as I've been thinking about that. Um, so you're right in everything you just said in that question. So um, it is healthy and it is processed. So it's a little bit of both. So it's not as healthy as a whole. If you're on a whole food plant-based diet to heal, um, to heal chronic illness, then I would say probably no pasta. It's too. It's a little bit too processed for you at that point. Um, and you're right. At that point, the the sugar has been changed, or the sugar, the um, the fibers have been changed and um, to be blended down into a flour and now made into a pasta. So it is a little bit less healthy than eating the whole food. I'd rather eat edamame than pasta pasta or brown rice than brown rice pasta for sure. Um, that being said, uh, if you're not in the process of healing from a chronic illness, uh, it actually has not been shown, I believe, I'm, this is my understanding, but you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it has not been shown to, to spike the blood sugar quite as high, you know, certainly not as a white pasta anyway, and that with a high fiber meal that it absolutely still has benefits to it, and there's plenty of fiber and there's plenty of uh, goodness to it still. So a small amount with a otherwise nice, delicious plant-based meal can be a part of a, of a healthy meal. And um, something I do include for my patients 
And it's a great substitute as you're getting off white pasta, helping you transition, or even if you're already on a diet and you just start including it, black bean pasta or edamame, some are healthier than others. But yeah, I absolutely think it can be part of a healthy diet and, and part of your meals. Um, so that's my take on it, but I'd be curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Well, it's an important question, uh, and the issue, um, and, and she's right in the, in the spirit of her question, in that uh, when you eat a whole grain, when you eat whole rice, whole quinoa, um, you, chew, you, you hydrate it with water, and then you chew it up, and it takes a half hour, hour or more for you, once you swallow it, for your digestive enzymes to work their way uh, into the grain of rice and start digesting the starch and the protein and, and, uh, and dismantling that very complex structure that is a grain of rice or a grain of quinoa or, or a, a kernel of corn. But, and as a result, um, even though there are sugars in the starch of the rice or the starch of the corn, um, it, it, it takes a long time for it to find its way in the bloodstream. And as a result from whole grains, the blood sugar rises very gently, not very high, and it's easy uh, for the body to clear it out of there, one pass through the liver and, and uh, a little bit of insulin, and poof, it's usually pretty much gone. Uh, but when you send that whole grain, send that rice or wheat kernel to the miller and they grind it into a powder called flour, then you're absolutely right. That changes the characteristic. That starch is now freely available uh, to, the, uh, to the environment, like your digestive enzymes. Uh, the fiber that's been holding those starch granules is now all broken up. And as a result, when you turn that, uh, that flour into a cookie uh, and you eat it, uh, nothing slows down the absorption. That, that the, the sugar in the flour now you know, is easy to turn into simple sugars, uh, leaps into your bloodstream, sugar levels go up, and you wind up with all, all the problems, the high insulin and all that that comes from uh, a lot of sugar in your blood. So, so flour products um, absolutely are, are not good for you as far as uh, blood sugar levels and, and all that applies. Um, and so I'm not a big fan of flour products um, for, for that reason and a few others as well. So where do pastas uh, fit in there? They're a bit of a different beast uh, because a couple of things where uh, when there's different types of flour, if you're making cookies or cakes, you want flour that's mostly sugary, mostly starchy. And so those are the pastry flours, and the, and the, the, the you find the uh, they grow wheat that is especially high in starches and it turns into pastry flour. But um, the, those are the soft wheats. But you can there's a whole other strain of wheat called hard winter wheat, and and hard winter wheat this is high gluten wheat. This is high. The, the, it, is, it is pasta flour. And it is a very high protein content because they're going to be making pasta out of it. And they want the, that protein to, to maintain the shape of the noodle. And so pasta flour is a high protein powder, much lower in carbohydrates. And, and when they turn it, when they do the pasta thing, they cook it, they add the water, they extrude it through the machine, etc. The, the protein um, combines with the, with the starch, with the flour. And, and as, it, as the pasta cools and sets from, and, and dries, um, the, the, the starch grains are incorporated into, mm -hmm. the, into the protein fibers uh, of the pasta. And that's what gives the pasta its al dente, chewy flavor. And as a result, when you eat it, a lot of that, a lot of the starchy uh, carbohydrate is locked up with the protein. And as a result, um, you know, pasta is, uh, is digested over a longer period of time, and the blood sugar, as Dr. Miller uh, suggested, it rises much more slowly. It's a gentler form uh, of carbohydrate, to say the least. Uh, and so, uh, unless you're, you know, frankly diabetic, uh, uh, and where sugar is an issue, uh, pastas, depending on the kind of pasta, uh, is often very gentle with the blood sugar. And finally, as your question applying nowadays, you know, it used to only just be wheat flour, that's what you get with, with pasta. But nowadays, you get pasta now made out of edamame flour and soy flour and rice flour, all these different flours um, that are higher in protein. Uh, so you can, so especially the leguminous, the, the bean flour, so the lentil pastas, uh, uh, the bean pastas are, are have very low glycemic indices. And so if 
that's an issue, uh, go with the leguminous uh, protein in, in, the, uh, in the particular pastas you're choosing. But by and large, pasta, long answer, but pastas are, uh, they're, they're more of a whole food than, than, the, than gross flour products are. And they're, gently, uh, and they're generally much gentler with the blood sugar issues. Yeah, uh, great. Love Excellent. that. Yeah. I was wondering, as I'm listening to you talk, Dr. Clapper, this is a question put out there for you and for everyone, but if you know that, um, you know how when you cook potatoes and then you cool them, it increases the resistant starch, so it's a great prebiotic, it's good for microbiome, so as I'm listening to you talk, is it a similar thing? Or similar, or probably, absolutely, oh, absolutely that's what happens, right? The, the, the starch reconstitutes itself uh, and becomes a more resistant starch, and it's much yeah. slower, so they're just like potatoes. Yes, good point. Thank you for yeah, that's adding interesting that. interesting for bringing yes. that up. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. See what we're all learning today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, so exactly. So we do work a lot with diabetics, and I tend to remove any of the pastas and the, the flowers in the very beginning at least until um, we see what they do. Because just um, I like to experiment on myself. So I've used a few continuous glucose monitors um, over the course of time just to see what a normal, I don't have diabetes, but I just would like to see what's happening because there's not a whole lot of studies on the normal response to blood sugars on, a, on people without diabetes. And it was interesting. I ate rolled oats, which I've done for years, and the berries and the bananas and soy milk and pumpkin seeds with it every, every morning for like a decade. And my sugar went up to like 163 and I was like, whoa. And so then I went to roll um, the steel cutouts from those roll cutouts and it barely hit to like, you know, like 130. So it's just really interesting, even in someone who doesn't have diabetes, but your body is still, it's just, it's an example of that processing. So that processing does allow that absorption to be much faster. And what I think I found with cooking, just a kind of a cooking tip is when you have like a call for, let's say like you know, a white flour or something in a recipe that you want to make. I use chickpea flour and I try to do like half of whole wheat flour and then maybe half of the chickpea flour and that works really well. So um, I don't know if you have any other maybe cooking tips, that Chris or Dr. K, that as far as it might be helpful in replacements. One of the replacements I use for my um, people with a lot of food sensitivities, um, once they've healed the initial part, not, this is not phase one, but a little bit farther along, I like the green banana flour. Um, mostly I first cho chose it because it's, it's not gluten, it's not a grain, it's just sort of out there and people weren't reacting to it. So I just kind of chose it for that reason. But then as I learned more about it, it's also prebiotic fiber. So it's um, got, it's uh, resist filled with resistant starch and it's a good one, but um, that's one that I like when I'm baking. And again, like Lori, I like to mix a couple different ones. So a little bit of a uh, bean flour with a, um, uh, with a, banana flour and then possibly an almond flour if I need it to be a little fatty or something. So I'll yeah. play around with it. But I, I, I don't do a lot of baking, so it's not something I play around with too much, but yeah, mind. the cassava flours are very interesting too. So but the, it, everyone's a little different, the density and stuff, but um, like it's a whole nother topic. But I do have <laughs> one other question. I know Dr. Clapper, you have a meeting um, in 10 minutes, but I I think this would be a great final question from Brian. He mm -hmm. says, um, since eating a plant-based uh, diet started five years ago, my fingernails have become thin and brittle. Um, for my whole life until then, I had thick, strong fingernails. Any thoughts or suggestions? Um, get the oils back into your nail plates there. Uh, and, uh, but make sure that, um, the other issue is uh, make sure you get enough zinc in your diet and uh, all the more reason for to eat whole grains, legumes and root vegetables, uh, beets and carrots and, uh, and potatoes, things that suck, that suck the, uh, uh, the uh, minerals out of the soil. But it, it, the, the uh, grains and legumes also have zinc, so make sure there's some zinc deficiency. But uh, have you changed your job or your uh, your uh, position that makes you wash your hands more? If, you, mm -hmm. you know, if you're now uh, a nurse in the ER, you may uh, uh, right. have a reason why you're using oil there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Chris, any Dr. Miller? Yeah, I don't have much more to add to that. I would agree with what Dr. Clapper just said. That's a tough one. So um, would I would want to take a look at, at what you're eating, make sure you have a balanced diet, make sure you're getting enough of everything. And we are all different. Some people aren't absorbing as well. So uh, if you're having some malabsorption, you may be deficient in some of your, your vitamins and minerals. And I see that even in people, if they have IBS symptoms or um, gas or bloating or indigestion, or even just the mildest little 
you know, their gut's not functioning perfectly 100% more normal, um, they could have vitamin deficiency. So vitamin D and like Dr. Clark said, the zinc and the B vitamins, magnesium, calcium, um, these are absorbed in the healthy um, small intestine. So anyone who's having any issues with that may be a little bit deficient. And sometimes I put them on a, or I would maybe consider it like a good multivitamin, at least for a short time, see if that can help too. Um, so just yep. some extra thoughts. I think that's a really good point, Chris. Uh, several there. One, when you see someone who they're like, I went on a plant-based diet and I, I just didn't do well. I didn't thrive. I had stomach issues. And so that's where you're talking about the IBS, SIBO issues. And mm -hmm. we have a really nice way of looking and working patients through that. And it's been very successful. The other thing is if you are on a whole food plant-based diet, you know, the beauty thing, the beautiful thing is that we can check those levels. So, you know, it'd be a good thing to make sure that you are getting everything that you need. If you have any question, if you're having like these odd things like thinning nails, you know, that's the other thing that we can do is we can see people who are healthy. Let's just do you know, once, once over, see how you're eating, let us check some vitamin levels, make sure everything's on par. And it's a great way to just kind of, you know, reassure yourself that everything that you're doing is, is uh, to the utmost ability to, to continue being healthy. But um, Dr. Clapper, any final words before, I know you have to, to check off right. before your next meeting. Right. Uh, no, um, feed your skin like you feed the rest of your body. And, um, and it's always, your skin is never not looking. It, it knows what you're eating, just like your arteries and your liver and everything else. So to my own skin be true. Uh, and uh, keep it hydrated and uh, um, uh, just be, be cautious with the sun. Uh, that's yeah, all. yeah, absolutely. Right. And uh, you know, it's like the canary in the coal mine, right? So it's 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 a sign. So it's a maybe an early indicator that something else is going on in the body. A lot of inflammation. So if your skin's erupting, there's an inflammation occurring somewhere, like Chris was saying, the gut and some other places. So, um, but uh, Chris, any other Final words of wisdom? I uh, know that I, that was a, well, I guess, yes, that was a fun talk. So I have been thinking about the skin. So thank you everyone for uh, agreeing to do that. And there's one other thought that I'm going to leave us all with. And that is, so with coronavirus, we're all using a ton of the alcohol. And before coronavirus, I was trying to not use as much of it, especially for autoimmune people or higher risk people, because some of the chemicals in it, um, like triclosan, have been shown to be um, disrupt hormones. And yeah, so some some things, some people with hypothyroid, it could have been an, it could be an issue. Um, and it's known to change the bacterial count, right? Because it's bactericidal, it's killing bacteria. It kills both good and bad, harmful and and non-harmful are microbiome on hand, and it's leading to an increase in um, resist in my in. Um, bacteria resistance to the antibiotics. And so this is a real problem. And so even things like what's called MRSA, um, we see a lot of this, this is methicillin resistant. It's a resistant type of bacteria. And there's also the non-resistant form, just Staph aureus. And so um, people who just had penal staph, you know, use this alcohol all the time and they were showing an increase in now in MRSA. And this is in mm -hmm. hospital workers. So um, I'm, I've been very aware of this for many years and I work in the ER and I would always try to find a sink in soap and water as much as possible. Sometimes you can't, you just use alcohol. I do what I do. I use alcohol too. But when I could find soap and water, plain old soap, non-bactericidal non, um, soap, just regular soap and water, that alone kills, kills viruses and bacteria. So um, I was encouraging my patients to use soap and water and using it myself and my colleagues and people I was working with for those reasons. And I was talking to the hospital saying, let's take out this these bad chemicals and that you're exposing all the hospital workers to. And then this happens, COVID-19, and now we have alcohol everywhere. And I agree, I'm using it too, because I'm scared, right? We don't want to die or get really, really sick from COVID-19 or spread it. So it is important, but at the same time, I just wonder what it's doing to our hand microbiomes and what the what's going to look in the future, like where what's going to happen because of this. And so I'm curious, I'm looking for data, I'm just kind of watching it. And I'm still doing my best to do soap and water, 20 seconds, whenever I can, and um, try to avoid a little bit extra alcohol if possible. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That's my thought. I leave this. <laughs> you know, and one thing too is when you do wash with soap and water, you know, you don't 
it did 20 seconds or so. If you've seen the alphabet, that's typically, and then just hydrate right afterwards with a really good hydrating lotion too. And that will help. Um, it's like every time I walk by the, the sink or wherever, I just like grab some lotion and rub it on. <laughs> Again, I'm in Colorado and things kind of suck you dry. feel like a prune some days, but you know, hydrate after you wash your hands too. And that will, that may help alleviate some of the dryness, but it is make you wonder about the microbiome yeah. on our skin and everything else, 100%. And uh, the long-term effects of the COVID-19 are a bit frightening as well. Like, what are people going to be dealing with for years after having um, an illness? So yeah. but anyway, but that was an amazing talk, guys. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to see myself, Dr. Miller, or the amazing Dr. Clapper as well, and Dr. Miller is my own doctor because I have hypothyroidism, so she's brilliant. Um, you guys check her out at plantbasedtelehealth.com and we'd be happy to serve you the best we can. We're in 40 states working on the last 50. I'm trying to be the first doc in the country to be licensed in all 50 in the plant-based sphere, so we're working on that. And we also can uh, consult with folks outside of the country as well. So we hope you will come see us there and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.